thank you all for coming to this panel, which and I always, when I hear this, I just think, God, man, no pressure. Go change the world. We could all die, but no pressure, you guys. It's all good. So, and I, you know, I do. I love that. I'm, I'm Kim Severson, by the way. And I work for a newspaper, so I love newspapers. And I, my favorite thing about this front page is that the Chef's Collaborative is uh, placed on the page in a way that's much more important than billions of Earths may be out there. So, <laughs> just shows you billions of Earths may be out there, but this is this Take is the, the bigger news. So. I thought that was, I thought that just sort of showed the place that, um, that food is in our culture right now. You know, and thank you, Melissa, for asking me to come and um, just facilitate mostly a conversation between these guys who know a whole lot more about um, what you do than I do. But I, I do ask questions for a living, and so I was really glad to be here. And uh, the topic was, what is the future of restaurants and the future <clears throat> of the chef? And, um, you know, it's such a big open-ended question. But really love to talk about transformation, because every, every time I come to these conferences, there's... Um, you just can feel the change that's happening, and it's, as Michael pointed out, it's a change that's happening from menus, and, you know, uh, menus are leading culture, and that's really what, um, what you all are on the forefront of. And both of these gentlemen have um, done an amazing job of, of remaking themselves and of <coughs> transforming themselves, and I, you all probably know Sean Brock, um, uh, who many of you have eaten at McCready's and, you know, who's there for a long time, um, I think eight years, is that how long it's been? Something like that. Right. Um, you know, it was all kind of about, you know, um, molecular gastronomy and transformation of food through technique and, you know, country ham, cotton candy and, you know, all that sort of thing. And then, no. I know, I was hoping <laughs> to get a little today, but, uh, and then in 2010, I think it's just your anniversary of like of uh, three years, three years from Hosk. Um, this has been a fast three years, which uh, some people said and do and it may well be true. The most important restaurant in the South, the Lantern, not ex certainly not excluded in that list. Miss <laughs> Andrea Rusing, um, and the runner-up goes to anyway. But it's you know, it, but it, it has been a significant restaurant, and it was a shift, a huge shift in uh, from taking global technique and. Uh, and flavors and thoughts to very, very local, you know, if it's not from the South, it's not going on the menu, and uh, uh, a very different approach to cooking. So it's been a huge transformation, and he's um, uh, gone to Africa twice this year to study uh, the, where the actual food that is uh, in the Southern culinary canon uh, came from, and I'm sure he'll talk more about that. But this notion of transforming himself as a chef and also transforming how Charleston eats and how the South is viewed as a restaurant region um, and how we eat has was, was been sig incredibly significant. And then Michael Ruhlman is also another man of, of transformation and you're all familiar with his you know, soul of the chef and reach of the chef and I think it was that last book, Underpants of the Chef, that was the big seller. Um, it was a children's book and it was... It was, no, a, anyway. pop, it was a pop-up. <laughs> right, it was a pop-up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Sean Brock. Two shows a night, folks. <laughs> Don't forget to tip your waitress. Um, yes, <laughs> that's right. It's very popular. Good morning. All right, all right. Um, God, I'm uncomfortable. Where's human resources? I'm uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, but, then, but then also transformed. Um, trans <laughs> oh, God. Hard up for jokes today. Anyway, um, transformed into, um, I don't know, why is the lesbian making penis jokes? It's eight in the morning. <laughs> I'm really confused now. Um, but, it, but also transformed himself into, an instru you know, into interpreting chefs like Thomas Keller in cookbooks and helping um, bring that to the page. And then um, his book, Ratio, which was um, kind of a revolutionary uh, way to approach food, the idea if you just understood the ratios, he would free you from recipes forever, and turned into an app, and now he is um, very much in the digital world, and also um, uh, creating in, uh, cookware, and very specialized cookware, right? Is that still? Yeah, I don't know how it happened. So no. he's, you know, so there's transformation there, again. So I think they're very good people to talk about the future of restaurants, the future of of chefs and uh, and and where we go from here, you know, I always am. It was at dinner last night at Husk with a group of chefs, and there was just this. So, what are we going to do about like, you know, we've got to stop the, um, you know, antibiotic resistant meat, and we need to do that, and we need to, and then trash fish, and you know, and there, this urgency. And I imagine that from a chef who just wants to make food for their 
to feed people that, that can feel overwhelming. Um, but there is, I mean, I have watched in my career writing about food, which has been a long time now, um, the cultural change has happened from the kitchen and from the plate. Um, you know, whether it's something like, uh, you know, just getting, for example, trans fat out of the diet, which happened because people just got educated and people stopped using it, and watching farmers markets go from four, four or six hundred in this country to now three or four thousand farmers markets, and farmers markets being the way that somebody goes and spends a, a Saturday afternoon. Um, you know, it's where families go. I, I have a daughter who's five and a half who, um, and we don't watch too much TV because well, that's a whole other story, but, um, but she uh, is really into the Kids Top Chef show that's out there. I don't know if you all have seen this, but she's like just really, like she would rather watch that than, than anything else. She also on Thanksgiving, or on Halloween, was um, going up to houses that were dark and saying, they're not serving today, Mom. And I, <laughs> so, but, but just the, the, cultural, the cultural importance of food and, and, how, it change, and how it changes us is, um, can't be understated. So what is the future of, uh, of the restaurant, the future of Chef? And I, Sean and we were having a little discussion before this um, that was really bringing, uh, bringing food back to... Um, to the guest, the idea of instead of going out and finding, or the, the sort of movement to go out and find uh, find trends and find techniques and find history, that now you had this thought about actually the future is the guest in a way. Is that you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, for a long time, and honestly, up until maybe four or five years ago, a chef would wake up in the morning and the first thing on that chef's mind was. Well, today I have to make delicious food. And I have to give, I have to serve the guests delicious food and give them what they want. These days, it's a lot different. Um, and there are many, many reasons for that. You know, we wake up in the mornings and the things on our mind are a lot different. You know, it's, it's about what you're talking about. It's about food politics. And um, because food is the most, like, I love how culture keeps coming up in these discussions because you know, cuisine and culture can't live without each other, uh, and they shape each other. And if you can have a small platform as a chef, you know, any time that you're ever sitting on a panel or on a TV show or in the media giving any sort of interview, people are listening, and people are turning to you for answers, and um, they're expecting you to have the answer, and they're expecting you to have the right answer because they trust you. And so that shows the importance of uh, relationships and relationships with the guests. And I think that's kind of even almost a new thing for me to t take that idea because we've been focusing so much on relationships with producers and uh, people just involved in the food industry. Well, all of a sudden, we need to realize who the consumers are and, and, and where the biggest pull is. And uh, we need to become friends with our guests. We need to. We need to uh, have relationships with them that, you know, they come into the restaurant with this sense of trust and uh, excitement and, and um, you know, being intrigued and wanting to know answers. And what that does is it pushes you as a chef to become more educated. You have to have the answers. And um, so, you, you're, so what you're saying is that it's one of the roles of the chef now, as it never has been before, is to educate your guests and your customers. And, and, and to educate them uh, about the overall food system in general, not just how to make hollandaise. You know, it's, it's um, because these are the people that are going out and, and purchasing food every day to feed their families, and, and that's the supply and demand theory in, in, in action right there. And those are, those are the, uh, I mean, that's the biggest group, you know, and, and for us, you know, like, we have, you know, the ability to influence a few hundred people a day, uh, and and we can do that through the story of food, and 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 that's the power of food. Like a plate of food can teach you so much, um, and make you realize so much. And I think these days chefs are starting to realize how valuable that platform is, and uh, how lucky and how fortunate we are to be able to have a voice, and and how fortunate we are that people are starting to listen. Um, it's it's a whole different world, I think. But where's the, the point where um, you sit down and you want to have a meal at a restaurant and 
<clears throat> at some point you don't necessarily want to be educated, you just want to feel good and enjoy the food. I think diners feel like they don't want to necessarily have to go to school every time they eat. So how do you, you know, teach, you know, educate diners when they're eating? Is it through the, is it through the taste of the food and then perhaps they'll ask a question and perhaps the server will tell them? Or is it the sensibility of your restaurant so they're attracted to your restaurant? Maybe they don't understand why they like the food they like and then you can bring them into sort of understanding. Where's that line between educating and giving pleasure and providing food to someone who's paying you money for it? Well, all those points are valid, and those are all things that you need to take into consideration. When we're doing lineups before service and we're talking about the origins of the dishes and the ingredients, you know, those are, that's why we're there. Um, but like you said, sometimes people just want to eat, and it's so important to read that guest. But that doesn't mean, I mean, I've certainly been stopped before people saying like, are you gonna let me eat or are you gonna tell me about the, the chicken's mother's <laughs> name? You know, like, <laughs> that, that certainly happens, but that, that still doesn't mean you should give up. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe they had a bad day, right. you know? <laughs> right. uh, and, and that chicken should make them feel better and, and then maybe they'll taste that chicken and be like, whoa, maybe I should have listened. This is really good chicken. Yeah, what is what this was chicken? The <laughs> exactly. Right. So, what do you think, Michael? Um, I, as you said in the beginning, you can feel overwhelming with all the, the mandates of the, f or f the food culture, all the things that we put on ourselves. You can't do everything. I can't do everything. Um, I still go to the grocery store and buy crappy meat, and it makes me unhappy, but sometimes it's my only option. Um, you can't do everything. I don't, know any, I don't know any restaurant, and I'd like to ask you this about local, you know, really what is the importance of local? Uh, how important is it? Because I don't know any chef, certainly not in Cleveland, there could be 100% local. I mean, I don't know how Rick Bayless gets 300 pounds of onions a week from nearby all year round. Uh, I, I believe him, but I think it's just very hard. So for chefs out there, how do they make the choices? I mean, wh what is important as far as sourcing local ingredients versus getting them shipped in? Because most people get, still get tons of stuff shipped in. You probably get stuff shipped in. You've got to you get olive oil shipped in. No, no. Texas. <laughs> well, um. <laughs> It's amazing. We, we, well, you, I mean, you made, you, made, you made your name by being sort of ultra-local. So you're the person to talk t to this point. Well, a few years ago, we had an opportunity to Coffee. Open <laughs> 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 that, trust me. I feel like I'm like on a Senate committee here. No, no, no. <laughs> Sir, did you not, in fact, serve coffee? No, chocolate, <laughs> spices. Yeah. Um, cinnamon, all those things. You know, a few years ago, we had an opportunity to open a restaurant and have a, a clean slate, a blank page, and we said, all right, well, what are we going to do? And I'd had the opportunity to travel uh, a lot that year, and I was getting sick and tired of people not respecting Southern food. Um, and I said, well, let's create a restaurant that's truly Southern. Let's only use the ingredients from here. We're only going to serve food grown in the South. And then um, that sounded fantastic at the table, you know, when we're having the meetings, talking about the idea of the restaurant. And then it became time to, to put it into play. And three years later, 500 guests a day, we've never bought one thing that wasn't grown in the South. Um, for, you know, obviously not coffee. <laughs> I know, I was kidding, I was but, kidding. But no, but here's the thing, and, and, and you push it as far as you can. And then when it comes to things like coffee and chocolate, you say, okay, um, if, if, it's, if, if there are a few things that are hanging out that, we, that are just impossible to grow here but we need for, to complete a meal, then they need to um, carry a very important story about a, a, a business or um, a person. And so, you know, we've, we found coffee that was, it was the first bean that came in, it was found in a time capsule, it was the first bean that came into the south and the coffee roasters came and they spent uh, a week with me in eating and like they modified their roaster to add more smoke in and then you know chocolate we found a guy in nashville tennessee making you know just a small guy making his own chocolate and so while it's you know the source of the actual product is very very important it's more about that what you keep saying and, and uh, what i love to hear is about community and it's about supporting community and um, giving people the confidence to start small businesses and to do things and take a chance and, and you know if if i hadn't Put myself in that situation, you know, I, I wouldn't have pushed myself to find all those people, and and that's the, the situation that came out of that was was what changed, you know, me as a chef, and as a person. You know, you push yourself to 
uh, every day because you know we live in a world of convenience and it's so easy to pick up the phone and order something and it's so easy to go to the grocery store and make a bad de decision and it's so easy to pull through the drive through at Chick-fil-A and eat a chicken sandwich but if you say I'm not going to do that and 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 you put yourself on a platform and 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 preach that then you absolutely can't do it. I mean, imagine if I got caught eating a Chick-fil-A sandwich. <laughs> yeah, TMZ. I do miss those things. <laughs> why, you, why, why is the story important? You said it's important to have a story. Well, I think, um, you know, we can learn a lot from what happened before our time and the generations before us, and, and those stories carry that. You know, like, if I'm a big seed saver, and people think that's silly, and... and you know, if you were to go to McCready's and open my seed saving freezer, you could you would be calling the TV show Hoarders and be like, this guy needs some help. Um, <laughs> but each, each of those seeds and each of those plants, they have a very particular story about a person, a place, or a period of time. And um, those are the things that remind us of the way things used to be and, and, and inspire us to change things uh, moving ahead. Stories do that, you know, but again, you know, you made a great point. It's like sometimes people just want to eat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think Portlandia, that show really yeah. <laughs> right. made us like take a couple steps back, you know, a couple steps back and be like, all right, well, maybe um, we should calm down. This a is where bit. like the diners actually get up from the table and drive out to the farm before they <laughs> before eat they the meat the where the chicken was grown. <laughs> and they're like, well, now tell me a little bit more about them. And yeah. Uh, what about, I think Thomas Keller made some, some comments a little while ago about, you know, I really just want to make the best plate of food possible and, um, you know, we're in a global society and sometimes that means borrowing ingredients that maybe aren't local or shipping things in and I see Asha Gomez there is like how, you know, cooking from, from the, uh, her village in south of India and, and obviously to do the kind of food she wants to do in Atlanta, you know, it's not necessarily going to be something she can source locally and her story is not it is a southern story. It's about you know the mixing of, of you know southern India and, and the American South. But to get the ingredients, I mean, I'm not sure they are producing the coconut oil you need. And in, in, um, so so there is this idea of making a you know kind of a global crossroads in your in your restaurant or finding ingredients that you can um, you know that that you want from the best of the world. And I don't know, maybe Roman, you've been a great interpreter of of uh, Chef Keller, but. What do you think he was talking about when he, he, when he, he sort of gave us the counter viewpoint on that and said, you know, my job's not to save the world, it's to make delicious food? Yeah, well, he, he basically said uh, that it, it, it no longer would really pertain to chefs anymore because they could get all the best ingredients. And his goal as a chef, he's probably changing now, given all of these changes and, and being shown what's possible to do locally. Um, but his goal was not to eat locally and is not to edu really at first to educate people, it was, it was about um, creating a, a great experience mm -hmm. uh, through food. So it, it didn't pertain to him. I haven't talked about the local issue now, but mm -hmm. per se couldn't exist without shipping in lobsters from Maine and lamb from Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and from all, you know, truffles from Italy. and mm -hmm. So it's, it's not an issue for him. But he, you know, he's changing the world in a different way. He's, mm -hmm. he's showing how to manage people. and and showing other things that are important. So again, there's no one right way, I don't think. There's not well, one Well, I think what he's doing, do. though, at the same time, is he's still continuing to tell those stories. He's telling the story of that person who, um, you know, brings in lobster for them. He's telling the story of the, of the shepherd in Pennsylvania. And, and that's where inspiration lies. You know, like you, you can inspire someone in, 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 in by telling a story, and it doesn't have to be from your backyard. You know, that lamb doesn't have to be from your backyard. It's about it's about making the right decisions and supporting people that make the right decisions. And we get so caught up on it being from our backyard. And while that's very, very important, and that's what we should think about first, oftentimes people say, well, I can't afford you know, to go to the farmer's market or buy this sort of thing because it's too expensive. But if you're spending money, you need to spend it um, on, on uh, products that are produced by people that are making the right decisions and and you know sometimes it's from Pennsylvania that's okay I don't I mean to me that's not a when do you when's the line between sacrificing deliciousness for the story or for the um, the localness of something I mean that's a, a moment where you know if you could get something local and perhaps it's not quite as delicious you now we were talking about 
um, you know, local foie gras maker in the south, and it, it, you know, um, I think with Anne Quantrano, who's maybe here, she, anyway, but like, you know, the idea is like sort of a little too soft to sear, it's a little too, but you know, it's, they're, they're doing a foie gras in the south, and if you're a southern restaurant, would you then buy that versus something from Hudson Valley or, you know, or imported from, um, from Europe, well, how do you make that choice? It's maybe not as delicious, but it's more local. So where does that point happen? I mean, it's, 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 um, it's an internal struggle that we all deal with because, you know, for, for, for waking up every day with the idea that stories are important and stories can oftentimes enhance a meal and make food taste better, but if the core of that, which are the ingredients in the products, aren't delicious, then you're going to lose people. They're mm -hmm. not going to pay attention. They're not going to care, and they're going to like, what is this idiot talking mm -hmm. about? And the perfect example of that is a story that I've told a million times, and it was the first bowl of Hop and John I ate in Charleston, South Carolina. I read about it and read about it and read about it in 19th century cookbooks and the bowl of food that shaped the culture. And um, this was in the late 90s, and I ate that bowl of food, and it was disgusting. It was terrible. It was awful. And I lost interest in low country cooking. And that's because nobody was growing Carolina gold rice. There were no African cow peas available. And that wasn't the chef's fault. You know, that wasn't, that wasn't the cook's fault. The cook was probably a great technician. Um, the chef was probably very creative, but he, he's only as good as the products that he has to work with. And um, that's, to me, that story I'll always tell, and I'm sure you guys are gonna get sick of it, um, and I'm getting tired of telling it. Tell us that story. I never heard it. Tell I us the story it. about the Hop and John again. Yeah. But, <laughs> but no, but the idea is like, if if it's not delicious, then you're just um, you're just sucking wind. You know, it's like it doesn't it doesn't matter. And that happened to me at a very crucial part of my career when I was 19 years old, going to culinary school, and I lost interest in low country cuisine. I said, what's the fuss? And if that can happen to me, someone who's like dying to eat a bowl of rice and peas and understand the culture and then lose interest, that, you know, the guests who are probably just hungry and would appreciate a good mm -hmm. story, are, you're going to lose them. And, and, and when it's delicious and when it blows someone's mind, then that, that's intriguing and interesting. And then you start to ask questions and your server, who hopefully is extremely educated, can tell you the story of that um, farmer that grew that uh, head of lettuce. And when that person wakes up the next day to go to the farmer's market, they seek out that farmer and everybody wins. And, and that's, you know, but if it's not delicious, mm -hmm. we're wasting our time. Mm -hmm. well, let's talk a little bit about the experience with getting back to the guest and relationships. Um, so I'm curious as we're talking about the future of restaurants, how is, um, what is the style of dining? Like, where do you <coughs> see this, this heading? I think we've gone through, and we were talking a little bit about this before, this great democratization with, um, you know, in the digital age. You saw, you know, fine dining and the appetizer entree dessert march change into something in which you would get one of the best chefs in the country and you could sit at a counter without a tablecloth and have them hand you the dish. And it kind of even translated into why food trucks became, you know, sort of a very populous way to get really excellent food. We had this educated palate and we can get it, you know, directly and instantly, this, this idea that, you know, the, the relationship between the chef and the diner is completely flattened and broke down. And where are we, where are we headed, uh, both of you, as you think, in the terms of the future of how restaurants work in culture and how we, how diners want to eat these days? Um, I'd like to answer that first before Sean does, um, because I'm from Cleveland, and Cleveland uh, it didn't have any good restaurants uh, a long time ago, and now it has a lot. And it, this is happening in every city that I've heard of. Um, the trend is deliciousness. The food mm -hmm. is getting better. Um, there's more of it. Uh, and so, I mean, there, and, and I know you'll agree, there's never been a better time to be a chef or a cook in America. Uh, this is, this is uh, a golden age of food preparation and food eating and food cooking and food availability. Uh, so I think uh, we're on a good road right now. Mm -hmm. Thanks to chefs and no doubt every single chef here or you wouldn't be here. Um, so that's where I see the trend going. I, I, I don't care if it's coming off a food truck or if it's coming from a four-star restaurant. Sometimes you want a special occasion. You want mm -hmm. to go to Le Bernardin mm -hmm. um, and have remarkable service. Cleveland, the service is terrible. Service is really hard to teach. You really need to learn service. We undervalue service. I think service is going to get better mm -hmm. uh, because we're realizing that it, it's an important part of the experience mm -hmm. to have mm -hmm. decent service. Um, so uh, just the, the quality, regardless of the environment, whether it's a parking lot in a food truck, 
four-star uh, dining place, a casual feeling restaurant like Husk. Um, it's just getting better and better. The, sh the salumi that Craig Deal is doing at Cyprus is just out of this world. It's as mm -hmm. good as it gets. Yeah, it's as good as it gets. Yeah. Uh, and it's really remarkable what he's doing. So everyone is elevating food, and the customer is demanding it. So we're all working together at this. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, th I don't, you know, I think we're always going to have these ups and downs and, like, what people think is exciting and trendy. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if it's your mother cooking it, someone in a food truck, or Thomas Keller cooking it. It's about what you experience when you eat it and the emotions that you have and, and like what's going through your head. And, and that goes back to uh, the relationships between everybody involved in getting that food on the plate and the people eating that food. And um, realizing that that plate of food is, is, is the biggest platform uh, for education and raising awareness that we could ever imagine or ever ask for. Um, and, and you have to see that as, as a golden opportunity to um, teach people. And because, you know, it, you, could, you could learn just as much eating it per se as you can from a food truck if, if you trust that person and um, have a relationship with them. Um, that's just the beauty of food, and it'll always be that way, and it doesn't matter if it's fine dining or casual. And, and it's important, Ben, don't, you know, don't overestimate the American population. Um, it's, it's largely stupid. Um, they need to be educated. That Vote for Michael Ruhlman, yeah. um, <laughs> leading the country. Of no, no, no I, I don't like people as a rule, um, and which is <laughs> why, why, why I work alone in my office and I only feel comfortable in a restaurant kitchen because yeah. most of them feel the same way. Um, but I, I really, that half and half story, I was, I was uh, at the grocery store and I saw a woman buying fat free half and half and I said, why are you buying that? And she said, Security? Can you get this guy out of here? <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me and said, because uh, it's fat free? I said, well, wh what do you think they're using to replace the fat with? And she looked at it and there was sugar. And that's all I said. I just wanted to find out, you know, what was her reason for buying a bad product? It's really important to educate people. Um, it's important that you educate them correctly. There's a great line in a David Mamet play, American Buffalo. Um, it all comes down to whether or not you know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> uh, and you chefs have to know what the fuck you're talking about. And that's part of why we're all here, because there's a lot of information, it's a confusing world, uh, we don't know all the answers. I, I am always learning, I know you're always learning, you're always learning. It's infinite. You know, I just had um, something happen to me that I never, you know, like, this whole save the seal thing. I don't know if you guys have seen this happening. Oh, the Canada thing? A few years ago, someone called me and they said, um, do you like seals? I said, sure. <laughs> seals, why yes. Name, can I put your name on the save the seal thing? I'm like, that sounds great. Fast forward a few years, um, Anthony Bourdain's emailing me saying, you're a moron, like, why are you supporting this? I'm like, what are you talking about? Seals are so cute, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't like seals? Anyway? But and delicious, that's the thing. I might it's add. Like, I had, I, <laughs> I had no idea what um, this whole thing was about, and, and what it's doing is it's it's punishing um, you know people in the fishing industry all over Canada, people who are already struggling, um, and and I still don't understand it fully. It's a it's a great it's it's, it's a great example of and how I, and, chefs were uh, you know sucker punched. Yeah, and I want, to know, yeah, and I want to know, and I'm, and this information is just so back and forth and all over the place um, that I finally said I'm just like. I'm out. <laughs> right. Or you can make seal lardo and right. just say. Mm -hmm. okay, but you know, I think that's, that's a, a you know the, the point that um, the fact that they were that, that a political movement was turning to chefs and if you could get chefs to buy on and then it would help your political movement I think really speaks to the power and importance of chefs in our culture and I think we've gone through periods in which different um, different things help define who we were. There were you know if you look at blues and jazz and and you know, things that helped us sort of define. Uh, racial issues in this country in the 70s film was sort of the the, the cultural currency um, now food is our cultural currency and the fact that you have um, you know the seal lovers trying to get chefs on board to, to further their political cause you know I'd love to see in the presidential campaign um, you know coming up where, where the, the Republicans and Democrats are vying to get chefs on their side in a very public way and I don't doubt that that could happen because that's that's how important food is 
to culture right now and how important chefs are. These things are never long enough, are they? No. Never. Well, it's an ongoing conversation. Yeah, um, and that's keep the thing. talking. It, it is about community and it's about sharing knowledge. And chefs now know that. They're no longer hoarding their recipes, they're spreading their knowledge. Uh, so it's important to spread knowledge. It's important to make sure your community at home is strong, your fellow restaurateurs in your own cities um, work together and not in competition with one another. Um, so, again, I think it's all about working together. Uh, and making the right choices, like Sean said. Um, know that when you buy a shitty product, you're, you're asking for more of it yeah, to be made. Yeah, you're saying congratulations for making a shitty product, here's some money, go make some more. Exactly, when you make a good choice, you're asking for more of that. So make good choices. Sean, any last? Uh... Oh boy, um, you know for me, I've, I've recently I've really been obsessed with the idea of culture and its importance. Um, and again, that's like a new role of a chef, it's like when, when, when do chefs sit around and talk about the importance of culture and how culture is affected by everything and most certainly food? But I think it's important to embrace your culture and because uh, that will give you an incredible sense of pride and um, that keeps your community together. You know, um, that's, and that, that all goes back to decision making and, and, make, and trying to make the right decisions. I mean. I'm probably going to make a bunch of bad decisions when I leave here today. Just, you know, maybe not purchasing food, but right. it's okay, you know, bad right. decisions happen, but, right. um, you know, you have to learn from that <clears throat> and do your best every day. And, and if you can just do your best every day, I think uh, we'll keep moving forward. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs>